the chance. I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 18 tonight. Luke chapter 18. And uh, I don't intend to keep you long on purpose. I'm not going to rush either. Just take my time. Yeah, it's something unusual maybe for a meeting like this, but it's the thing that's on the mind, so that's what we need to go with. Brother McGay, you said be yourself. I always heard what in Rome do as the Romans, but whatever the case may be. I, I don't know what your pastor was getting at when he said he hated me sometimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I never, never hate your pastor. I really never have. Uh, it's, sometimes we get off-handed comments. You know, I spoke at a pastor's fellowship a couple of years up in Wisconsin, and the last time I did, I sat back down, and the fellow in front of me said, Brother Huff, that's the most encouraging time I've ever heard you preach. <laughs> I already mentioned I already said the message I was insecure, you know. <laughs> so okay, now he's just tugging on my string here. You know, because you, you think what does that mean? I never ever have said anything encouraging at all. <laughs> or does that mean that, you know, I I've just said a lot of encouraging things and you really talked it this time. And I didn't think of it as that encouraging either. You know, I mean it was some instruction that I thought was probably valuable, but I didn't know what to make of all that, so you know what you do? You just, yeah, <laughs> in one ear and out the other, I guess. But uh, I'm used to being hated everywhere I go. I just didn't think it would get in here. <laughs> I want you to stand. Uh, I'm different. Um, I, I, I got under conviction some time ago, kind of, you know how Nehemiah and Ezra and those guys would get burdened just about everything they saw around them knew they were part of it, but uh, just saw tendencies and inclinations and confessed not only their own sins, but everybody else's. And, and just frankly, I think we're just too irreverent. I think uh, we have embraced irreverence uh, in the name of informality. You don't want to be formalistic or ritualistic, but uh, I, I do believe that it's real important that we learn to show respect. And uh, I never was taught, I don't come out of a background where standing to read the Bible was something that was normal, but I do believe it's a sign of respect for the scriptures. You can find a president for it in Ezra 8, and if you don't do it, that's fine. I'm not insulting you or, or uh, telling you you're wrong for not doing it. I just, I've come to that as a custom uh, when I'm reading the Bible in public, is to ask folks to stand with respect for the scriptures. And the next words that you hear will be those of Almighty God. And I'm reading from verse 15. And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no eyes enter therein. And God shall add his promised blessing to the reading of his own infallible word. And let's pray. God, I ask you to help us tonight as we open up the scriptures and look at this subject. And uh, may the things that we need to hear be said, the things we don't be forgotten. And I ask, Lord, that uh, there would be a transformation in our thinking and in our conduct wrought by the Holy Spirit from having heard this and the other things we've already heard tonight and throughout the week. Improve us for your use in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I, I want to begin by a little doctrinal stuff here, just a little teaching, because uh, in order to understand what's really going on here, you've got to understand what isn't. And let me begin by saying that the word infants, right there in verse number 15, I've heard different explanations about that. And uh, I'm going to tell you what I believe about it. I not only believe that your King James Bible has the right word there, but I also believe that the word infants, as used there, means infants. Yeah. Now, there's more than one way of translating that Greek word, and I'm not here to try and give you a Greek study. That's not even the point at all. But I did look it up because I've heard it, you know, well, that word infants also means young children. So, you know, supposedly infants means young children or anything up to a teenager. Well, I looked it up and... And uh, it can be translated young children as well as infants, but the primary definition, if you're going to use it, in other words, the way that this word, there's one way that that word would only be used 
for the one thing, in the words, well, I'm trying to say it, I'm getting all twisted around saying it. The word for an unborn child, that's the word right there. There's other ways of using that word. But if you're going to talk about an unborn child, there's one word that you would use to refer to an unborn child. That's the word there. It can be translated infants. It can be used to refer to young children. But if there's only one word, and that's the word used to refer to an unborn child. That's the primary definition. But it's pretty clear. It says there Jesus touched them. They brought unto him infants, and he would touch them. And, and I'm sure that we don't have a bunch of pregnant women walking up with their belly sticking out and Jesus doing this or any kind of miraculous thing where he's touching babies in the womb. So it's pretty clear from the passage that the children had already been born. Somebody's carrying them and Jesus touched them and touched them in a very ordinary way. And uh, if he was touching unborn children, then he would have to do something quite miraculous in order to touch those unborn children are quite unorthodox. And the passage doesn't indicate anything like that. But you know, the interesting thing is here, and this isn't a subject, but I think that the Bible is telling us something about abortion. And I think in 1611, when the King James translator sat down, they wrote down infants. And you want to research that word. There's not much difference between a baby on one side of the womb and the other. It's still a baby. Uh, from the moment of conception all the way up until it's, it's a baby right then and there. But you know, we have these partial birth abortions, and I don't mean to be indiscreet. I'm not going to describe them. I did once, but I've learned a lot since then, a long time ago. But uh, a, a partial, that, that baby's half born. It's, ha it's alive halfway out of the womb, and it's dead the other half because of something the doctor did. Yeah, that's right. And it's infants, you see. And infants and little children, the next verse, Jesus said, He called the disciples unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me. So you've got to hold an infant. And then he says, suffer little children. And little children and infants are human beings at different levels of development. And, and they're not the same in terms of the way they respond to what's around them. Little children can understand things that an infant can't. Little children can communicate with language. Little children can know themselves to be guilty sinners. Yeah. Little children can experience conviction of sin. And little children, in turn, can believe the gospel and repent and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus was to have said, and that's a different word in the English, but it's also a different word in the Greek, and again, it doesn't matter, but it comes out infants in one verse, little children in the next, a distinction is made because infants haven't gotten to that point yet where they can communicate verbally and they can know themselves to be sinners and they can experience conviction. And Jesus did not say, suffer infants to come unto me. He said, suffer little children. Because infants haven't gotten to the point where they can believe. And haven't gotten to the point where they can trust. And Jesus used a different word on purpose. It may be that he was holding infants, but he didn't say, suffer infants to come to me. For such as the kingdom. He said, suffer little children. And if he was to say infants, that would confuse a lot of things doctrinally, wouldn't it? I mean, that would mean in order to be saved, you had to come as an infant. Right? And he said, no, you come as a little child. The way the little child can understand their sinfulness, the way the under, little child can be brought under conviction of that sinfulness, the way a little child can repent of that sinfulness, the way a little child can trust and believe, that's what we're supposed to do. But if, if he said infant, then, then we'd have to go into tulip theology, wouldn't we? Yeah. We'd, we'd need to be reformed Christians, have a little, little uh, bird bath up here and bring the babies up and sprinkle them with water to make sure that they were in the covenant. Yeah. Yeah. I never did understand infant baptism. I mean, you were talking about an example of circular reasoning, if there ever was one. They believe that when a, uh, it's not everybody, but the reformed people, but some of them are saved, honestly, they believe, they believe if you sprinkle that baby, you are ensuring that they're in the covenant. That means they're one of the elect. You say, well, does that act of the parents having the baby sprinkled Make them one? No, they were elect from eternity. Well, then how, you know, is it possible that a child who wasn't one of the elect could be baptized? No, it wouldn't because God wouldn't have allowed that. So the very act of sprinkling those babies is insurance that they're one of the elect. And so infant baptism has never sent anybody to heaven, but I'm sure it's helped some folks go to hell. Because when they when they know that they were sprinkled as babies and if they believe in covenant theology, they believe that they must have been one of the elect or they wouldn't have been. That's right. That's right. 
So therefore, being one of the elect, what need is there for repentance? What need is there for conversion? What need is there for any kind of moving the Holy Spirit on their heart and then having a born-again experience? And you ever hear somebody say, I've been saved my whole life? Or say, I've been saved my whole life? Yeah. Sure. Somebody, somebody got that. And so the Bible is very clear. Your King James Bible is very clear making a distinction between something happening to an infant and what happens when a young child can come. You don't have to be a grown-up. But you have to be something more than an infant. You have to understand some things. And if, if it was infants, we would forget all about free will. We'd forget all about conviction and repentance to salvation. Because an infant can't do any of those things. A parent has to do it for it. So there's no argument for infant baptism to be made here. I know you're Baptist people. You didn't think there was anyway. But you know, once you adopt the false teaching, you've got to really struggle to find verses to support it. Yeah. And so uh, someone says, well, I'm, I believe in infant baptism. I'm buying into it. Well, then you're going to ransack the Bible for something to prove it with. Yeah. And anything that gives you any possible straw man to stand up, uh, that's what you'll use. And the argument is here, well, since Jesus touched the infants and uh, we're supposed to come as a child, he says, that's to be taken as that you come as an infant and infant baptism is the best way to ensure that. So that's why they sprinkle their children. And uh, that's not what he did. You know what he did? It's a whole lot more like a politician than it is like a priest. As far as what the Lord's doing here. People are bringing up their little babies. It's kind of like what happens at Christmas time and Easter time. Around here, probably at the malls they do it. I'm sure they do. And uh, I don't recommend this. But you know what happens. I mean, Christmas time, they're getting in line to sit on Santa Claus's lap, right? Or the Easter Bunny. They get all up in line to, to go sit on the Easter Bunny's lap and get the picture taken with the Easter Bunny. Now here you've got Jesus who's a, a popular cultural figure and people get the idea, hey, let's, let's get the kids up there to meet Jesus. The kids have heard about Jesus. They knew there was a popular man who did amazing things and taught wonderful things and everybody was talking about Jesus and the kids were interested and so they bring their children up there and the disciples are watching and they're seeing this and, and maybe some six-year-old is one thing. And that six-year-old can communicate with the Lord. He can talk to Jesus. And Jesus can talk to him and the disciples are sitting back and they're thinking, eh, okay, maybe it's not too big a waste of time. We'll, 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 we'll let this go. But then some mother has the audacity to say, oh, here, Jesus, look at my baby. And Jesus takes the baby and sets it on his knee and cuddles it coos at it a little bit and maybe tickles it, you know, or does some kind of silly game with it. And the disciples are watching that. And, and I know I get jealous for my time. I'm very jealous about my time. I don't like to have my time wasted. And I get jealous for other people's time. And somebody comes through my church that I know is a busy man, a hard worker. You know, Sam Gipp was just at our church last week. And if I see, you know, we have people that, that uh, have a tendency to just, they're parasitical time leeches with tonto complexes. <laughs> And, they'll, and they'll, they'll go up to a guy like Brother Gip and take all night long asking him dumb questions that they've asked other people before and gotten the same answer that he's going to give them. And they're not going to do anything with anybody's answers anyway. They just want to have the thrill of taking up Gip's time. And I'm jealous for that. I want to run interference with that. And I'm sure that the disciples are looking at these mothers with their little infants, bringing them up to Jesus, and they're thinking, Woman, you're wasting the Master's and we can put up with that with a four-year-old or a five-year-old or a six-year-old because they can at least understand something. But these little babies, what is the point? What is, is this just a big waste of time here to bring these babies up to Jesus? And, of course, Jesus rebukes them for that. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But one more doctrinal thing. Uh, infants that die as infants don't go to hell. They don't go to any place called limbo. You understand that the infallible ex cathedra Catholic Church, you know, that speaks from Peter's seat and always gets it right, is re examining limbo again. As an article in Chicago sometimes last week, you know, they've resurrected the doctrine of limbo. They're reconsidering uh, about limbo. Well, let me say children are born in sin. David said, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And that doesn't mean that there was a sinful act in conception. He had a bunch of older brothers. Okay, so it wasn't like he was the first one and that one was a mistake and then they got married, had a quickie marriage to legitimize. David was like, what, seven, nine? How many brothers did he have? Eight? Yes, he was the ninth one. 
uh, I'm sure it's embarrassed by that point, okay? So he wasn't illegitimate. But sin was there. And you know the doctrine, your pastor's talking about the flesh here just a little bit ago, and the old man. There's three Bible words for the reason, for the cause of sin in a believer. It's three Bible words. The old man, well actually, three Bible terms. <laughs> That's three words right there. We have the old man, the flesh, and sin. Those are the only terms in the Bible that are used to describe it. And then we come up with euphemisms. We talk about the sin nature, the Adamic nature, yeah. whatever it is. But sin. And Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Yeah. And so they're born in, that's how they can die. Infants can die because they have sin in them. Death passed upon all men in that all of sin. But Jesus Touching these infants isn't doing anything to save them. Okay, there, there's, there, there's, there's no grace being transmitted here. Jesus handling babies is not adding grace to their account so that somehow they'll collect enough grace so they can be saved someday. Touching the infants doesn't mean that the infants are going to be saved. And the infants that didn't get touched by them physically, that doesn't mean they're not going to be saved. Those infants could die and go to hell or they could be saved later on. But... The, the thing about children is there's no penalty for sin because they don't, li infants, little, little, little infants, the ones that can't understand, they don't know that they're sinners. They have sin, as in Adam, all die. Even so in Christ, all be made. I was astonished to find out that there are independent Baptists, and I mean people that go to a Baptist college somewhere in northern Indiana that I'm sure you've all heard of, that, that, that they teach over there, there is no such thing as a sin nature. No, there's no, there's no original sin. That, you, get, you become a, When you sin, you, you are not a sinner by virtue of a sin nature. I was astonished to hear that. That, was a, that was really blew me out of the water. I thought, what in the world? How in the world could anybody that is remotely orthodox deny original sin? As in Adam, Paul died. Even so in Christ, so will be made alive. But they, they can die because they're sin, but they have no responsibility for their sin. And their sin is washed away by the blood of Christ. And so is there a point to bringing these infants into the presence of Jesus Christ is the question. It's not going to save them. If they die, whether he touched them, whether he didn't touch them, they were going to go to heaven anyway. And they probably weren't going to die. They're probably going to... Or eventually they would, but not as infants, and they grow up to become children, and they got to make a decision anyway. So it's not like mom and dad can, those days, you know, we're talking about 2,000 years ago, not like they could bring out the picture album and say, here, look at this. This is when you were this little, and Jesus came to town, and we brought you and stood in line and sat you on his lap, and we got a picture of it so that you can see now how cute you were when you stood in line to see Jesus, like the Easter money or something. There's nothing like that. So the disciple, this is a waste of time. But I don't believe it is. I think that the best things you can do for an infant is to get him in the presence of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Imagine the scene. Again, it's kind of like what you might see at the mall when they get in line to see the Easter Bunny. But the disciples are bothered by it. And they shouldn't be because what they missed is this. One of the best things that could ever happen to any infant is for that infant to be as often and as early as possible in the presence of Jesus Christ. I don't understand parents. It'll take six weeks for that baby to grow before they bring it to church. You know, I, got, I got both kinds in my church. I got folks who, when, when the baby comes, don't expect to see baby or mom for six weeks or more. If it's winter, even longer than that. And I got other ones. I, I, my secretary, I mean, she had that baby in church three days after it was delivered. She brings it to church with him when she, when, her, when she comes to work. You know what? And, and I believe that's a good thing. You say, how, why? What difference does it make? Because if we meet here in God's house, he said, we're two or three are gathered together in my name. They're mine in the midst of them. I believe that the presence of Jesus Christ is here in this place and in any church where the gospel is preached in a very special and a very unique way. And I have no doubt at all that infants can pick up on that. Yeah. They read things in atmosphere yeah. and respond to it. I remember when Amy was just a little bitty thing. We had WFSI on. That used to be your classical radio station here in Detroit. I think it got sold into probably, who knows, probably, probably rap or something now. I have no idea what filth it is. But, but, he, but it used to be. We'd go in the morning, call Grit and Tyne and play lighter stuff. And then Dave Wagner in the afternoon, he was funny. Those guys were funny. They had personality. 
And then that stuff shirt in the, in the middle of the afternoon, he'd get on, he'd play at what? Bartok and Stravinsky and Ravel and Shostakovich. And we just had the radio on, you know, and, and his program came on and, and uh, didn't really pay any attention to it. But even just for some reason, she just, yeah, 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 yeah. And the dog was acting weird and I was irritable. And I know, oh, listen to that. It's feeling. You know, some discordant, weird, off the wall, 20th century, lost in the Oriental Swamp, John Ruben calls it. And, and I called the radio station and complained. I turned it off, put on some Christian music. The dog calmed down, the baby calmed down, I calmed down. Okay, nothing verbal going on, but something in the atmosphere. You say, we ought to see our nursery. It doesn't matter. I don't care if the nursery, and by the way, it's a good reason to try and keep the nursery in some kind of order. But, you know, even if the nursery is in an uproar, you bring that child through that door right there. And I have no doubt if the presence of God is here, that child picks up on it. As soon and as early as possible. What's the point in that? Well, to get them into his presence. You can't bring him here physically. But, you know, if you can bring your children to where the presence of Jesus Christ here is they'll sense the atmosphere and you can teach them to love church before they can even give you the alphabet. How about that? Amen. And by the time they can give you the alphabet, they're already talking about how they can't wait to get to church, how they love church, how they enjoy church. You know, and you Sunday school teachers and you nursery workers that have those little children in there, it is so important for you that you come in here filled with the Spirit of God, right. that you have God's Spirit on you, that the Holy Spirit Spirit of God is reflecting Jesus Christ out of you to so those little children. If you can't, if He can't handle them physically, but they sit on your lap, they'll sense Jesus Christ in you. And I know that's, that, that, that is invaluable. And there's so many things like that, and that's not the subject of the message at all, but there's so many things like we just completely miss what we could be doing if we just had some sense about it. You know, there's people who watch how you go to church. I had a missionary, I, you met Gideon, you know, he's got a friend, uh, Radix Raja Krishna. And Radix was uh, living near St. Louis area. He was a bell ringer in a Hindu temple. I don't know what a bell ringer does, but it's something in a Hindu temple. You've got to have some kind of credibility and, and have sold yourself somehow, whoever's in charge, to some point to where they say, hey, we want you to be a bell ringer. So he was a bell ringer in a Hindu temple. And, and, he and his wife, professional people in their early 20s, making money hand over fist, buying their first house. And the person that sold the house gave him a gospel tract and said, hey, how about you come and visit our church? Okay. He thought, sure, why not? Stuck it in his pocket, didn't give it a second thought really until Sunday morning. He woke up. I'm sure the Lord told him, but you know, he didn't know what it was at the time. But he thought, you know, maybe we should go. And they were really enjoying the house. They'd moved in. You know, they only been there a couple of days, but they were just enjoying that house. And he said, it would be nice to go see the person that we bought the house from, now that we're in it, it's our house, and tell them how much we enjoy their house and how glad we are they sold it to us and how much we appreciate the whole thing. So let's go to that church and we'll see them there. And he said, we came in, and what really struck me was how much the people enjoyed singing. They smiled and they were enthusiastic. He said, and they were friendly to me and my wife. He's an Indian guy, and she's not. She's white, Caucasian, American, you know, and some people got a big problem with that, but he didn't get a lot of attitude off of that. Yeah. May I say the greatest day in my ministry may have been the day God delivered me from being a bigot. If it wasn't the greatest day, it's one of the greatest days when God delivered me from being a bigot. But that's another, that's another subject there, too. But they didn't give off a lot of attitude towards him. They loved him. And you know when he said, I liked it so much, I went back. And he went back for about six months and he got saved. Amen. You know what brought back those? The people were acting like they enjoyed. Do you know you have a moral obligation to act like you're enjoying yourself when yeah. you're in church, right. whether you are or aren't? Right. I don't care if the preacher offended you. I don't care if you don't like the music. I don't care if you don't like singing. I don't care if you, if you don't like anybody in the building. When you come through those doors right there, you have a moral obligation to behave yourself as though this is the greatest thing that ever happened to you because somebody is watching how you do church. 
And you see, Radix Radhakrishna is now doing his deputation to go to a province in India where there's a city of over 15 million people and not one single Baptist witness, if any Christian witness at all, in that city of 15 million people. You understand the souls of millions of people might depend upon whether you have a good or a bad attitude when you come through that day. Amen, that's it. Amen. Amen. People come to my church, you know, and uh, so my, they're bad at my wife or whatever, and you can, you can just... They won't look up at you. They won't smile. They won't sing. They're got, if, if you can see what's spiritually there, they got barbs sticking out all over them. And they think they got a right to act like that because somebody offended them. God, have mercy on your selfish, ungodly soul. You are so million, many millions of miles away from any kind of communication with God. If you think that you have a right to reflect off of you dissatisfaction, if you're up a myth tree, if something bothers you, to show that in any way, in your countenance, in your posture, your disposition, God help you. Amen. You understand, you don't know who's watching how you do church. I've got Gideon, he's got a bunch of members of his family. We've got, a, we've got an Indian church now. And they meet every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and he preaches to them. There's about 30 Indian people. Amen. Come. We speak Ugrati or Gujarati. It's one of several Indian dialects. We say right there in our church. And he testified to that once. He, he said, you, don't, you folks don't realize it, he said, but he said some of these young men, small children, young, young, young boys, and some of these teenagers, these Indian, they're watching how you do church. His whole province in India, his dad and his grandfather were saved under the preaching of an old-time Nazarene Methodist type fellow. He said, but the Methodists in India now, he said, it's just a social problem. But the one that led my dad to the Lord, he was old time fireball, hell, you know, hellfire and damnation kind of preacher. And he had some people saved. And matter of fact, just about everybody in that little village where he's originally from was saved as a result. He said, but that church is dead now. He said, and in the, in the Gujarati province of India, millions of people, there's not a single Baptist church. He said, there's a few Pentecostals that are get, getting something done. And that's about it. As far as anybody having anything shaken, he said it's, a, it's the Pentecostals that are doing the best. He said the Protestant missionaries aren't getting anything done and the Baptists aren't even there. You see, and people, people will come in that door and sit there and scowl at me if I say something they don't like, not realizing that there's a 5-year-old boy or a 10-year-old boy or a 15-year-old boy that God might be trying to get a call into his heart go to that Gujarati province. He already knows the culture. He knows the language. He's got family. He's got ties. He can get in there. And the way some Christian responds to something that offends him may make the difference between whether he decides to go or stay. You know, it's important that you have the presence of Jesus Christ. I suggest that the younger your children are, the more careful you should be to cultivate the presence of Jesus Christ in your home through praying there and reading the Bible there and being modest there. Not just when you come here, but modest in your home and praying godly music and having proper discipline and proper training. I assure you, little children can derive Plenty of benefit from being in Christ's presence. Yeah. And while we can't do that in the flesh, we can certainly have His presence in the Spirit. I get in Christian home just because somebody says that everybody lives there is Christian. You know not every place is a Christian home. Some places are little hell holes. There's no sense of the presence of God in them or about them at all. And let me tell you, if you care for the salvation of your children, you won't allow strife, friction, conflict and resentment and envy in your house. You won't have it. You'll have clean music. And you'll have love between you and your mate. There won't be strife and conflict. There won't be worldliness and carnality and lust and smut. You'll do everything you can to keep your house clean in every conceivable way. And you won't be sorry that you did. 
There's a lot of traditional stupidity about children. I, you ever, you're the only pastor in here besides me, right, Bob? Brother Bob? Any other pastors here? You know what I found out after years and years and years? I would try to instruct people on how to properly discipline the children. And, and please, you know, if you think I'm one of these puffed up, arrogant, um, you know, know-it-all, uh, you know, come to me for all the instruction on how to raise children. I'm not trying to say that, but I, I do believe I understand something about it. I made a study of it. I really did. Before I was ever even thinking about going into ministry, after I was saved, I knew I knew nothing about being a parent. Nothing at all. They threw me out of high school when I was 15. They said, we don't want you here. You don't want to be here. If you don't come back, we won't send anybody to get you. Just go away. And that suited me fine. It really did. I, I mean, they can only expel you when you're 16, but they just called me and said, listen, we won't come after you. If you don't come around here and bother us, we won't come bother you. Just, just go away and, and, and don't worry about any kind of through an officer hunting you down. They're not going to send them. After I was saved, it occurred to me that if anything was ever, God was ever going to do anything with me, it might be a good idea that I should finish high school. So I went back. I graduated 21 years old. I graduated from high school. And as I went back, I, you know, again, I, I was saved and I thought, well, maybe God can do something. I expected to be dead before I was 21 when I was lost. And now here I am, 21, graduating from high school, you know, a few years behind, but I got a life ahead of me. And, and I didn't know anything about raising children. I actually signed up for child development. I took a whole mech course, child development. Why? Because I didn't know anything about children. And by the way, everything they taught me in there was wrong. Sure it was. But I, I wanted to learn something about how to raise children. I went down to Pensacola. You know, I, I watched families in the Church of Maryland where I was saved. And I watched them see how whose children were turning out good. You know, if they had teenagers and little kids, I'd especially study them, look at their teenagers, look at the little kids and see what they were doing with the little kids if their teenagers were bad, see what they were doing with the little kids if the teenagers were good. Got down to Pensacola, you know, we're going to change the world. We're turn the world upside down. And, and, and most of the kids, just like a bunch of Comanche Indians on liquor, running around the church just wild and out of control. But there was one fellow, Ron Sutek. Was he there when you were there, Ron Sutek? And, you know, he'd sit there after church. He'd stand with people come around and talk to him. And he had several little boys, three or four of them, it seemed like. I don't remember exactly, but he had several little boys. And they would sit there in an orderly fashion. Not like little robots, you know, but just sit there in an orderly way. And they would call her or talk or play with some little toy they had. But they wouldn't disrupt and they didn't run wild like every other kid in the church. They were behaving. You know what I did? I studied that man. I thought that man knows something about raising children. I, I, I didn't just figure, you know, you just have them. Just have them and everything will come out. I wanted to make a study. I don't profess to be some kind of an expert of it. This is what I figured out. After, after years and years and years of preaching certain things about how to raise children and how to discipline children, how to correct children, and seeing the incredulity and bewilderment and, and absolute rejection of everything I was saying in people's faces, I realized something. They don't have a Bible view of what a child is. And until they have a Bible view of what a child is, they'll never understand what the Bible says about how to train one. If their idea is humanistic and shaped by a wrong philosophy, then this idea of a child requires these kind of ways of shaping that child. And if you have a false concept of what a child is, you'll never accept Bible teaching because this and this, they never meet. Exactly right. And I, was, I would just see in, the, in their mind, it was just like, you know, no, nothing can go wrong, go wrong, go wrong. It does not compute, you know. I asked, cognitive, no connection between what a kid was and what to do with them because they didn't understand. I stopped teaching on children, raising children. I really have. I stopped teaching them. I started trying to teach on what a child is. If I can get that into their head, what a child is, then maybe they'll understand what the Bible says about how to handle it. But as long as they got this humanistic idea of what a child is, they'll never ever get what you're saying about how to train it. You know, there's people that have just dumb ideas about kids. Some people think that they have to be sprinkled as soon as possible. And if they die without that, they can't be saved. They'll go to hell or limbo. Others say that infant baptism automatically saves them. And again, now they're safe. They're in the covenant. Others think children are naturally innocent and don't sin. The Bible says they're estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born. Speaking lies. 
You understand before that, before you get that baby home from the hospital, it's lying to you. I'm glad you're laughing. You must believe it. But, but I, I said to them, they look at me and they say, what? What do you mean? Well, it's God's word says it. Yeah, but it can't mean that. <laughs> not my little dear. Uh, it's not that. It, it ain't cute. It looks like E.T. and it's full of the devil. <laughs> but you don't see it that way. You think it's a beautiful little angel, don't you? Children are born in sin. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And then Jesus said, that little thing right there is an example to you and me. And, and you understand, we're talking, when he says, come as a child, and of such is the kingdom of heaven, and receive as a child, you understand he's talking about what we would call a good kid, not a monster. <laughs> the testimony of Scripture is that children are precious to God. They're the heritage of the Lord, the fruit of the womb, womb is his reward. You know, I know what your preacher preaches about this, I agree with him. Absolutely. You know, what a strange way to start a marriage off. You're a liar. You say, we want God in control of our, of our lives, and we got God in control of our marriage. But we're going to use birth control for the first couple of years. You know what that is? That's not a marriage. That's a protracted date with legalized sex. You're not ready to get married. If you're not ready to have children, you are not ready to get married. Good. Prepare for thyself in the field. And afterwards, build thy house. If you don't have the maturity, and if you don't have the position in life, if you don't have the income, if you have not accomplished enough as a man to be able to afford having children, you're not a man yet, and you shouldn't be getting married. And when you become a man, and you make your place in the world, and you can afford to have children, that's when you are mature enough to have a wife. And if you start out before that, you're asking for trouble. I didn't say you'll be divorced in three years. I didn't say you won't work out. I didn't say you, none of your kids will turn out right. I didn't say the whole thing is bound to be a disaster. I'm just saying you weren't ready and you're going to have extra trouble. If the sex is worth it, I guess you weigh that out. And I'm not trying to be crude here, but you ought to be thinking about more than that. And the fact that you're not tells me something else. That's what... God, let him, when he say, we'll be in control of the womb, but we want God to control everything else. God, please help me get that job. And God, please help us to get an apartment we can afford. And God, please help us with this. And God, please help us with that. But don't mess with the womb because that's something we want to have control of. You hypocrite. You don't think God sees through that? Children are precious in God's sight. And, and, God, and He cares as much for them as He does for grown up people. And, and they matter, you understand? Not just when they become teenagers, not when they become teen boppers, not when they become adults, not when they become kindergartners. They matter from birth, but they matter even from the moment of conception. Yes. And they can receive salvation. Now the question is when? Spurgeon, Dave Spurgeon told me that he said... Uh, he said, well, sometimes I'll talk to guys and they'll say, all right, I've sinned so terribly, you know, I've done such, so many bad things that God couldn't possibly forgive me for these things. And he says, I call them a, lie, a proud liar. And he said, because what you think is you have more sin than God has grace. Isn't that, isn't that a terrible, terrible sin? I mean, God forgive them for that sin too. But that's maybe the greatest sin they've committed. Probably the greatest sin they committed is to think that they have more sin than God has grace. Well, you know, I don't understand parents. I, 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 nothing is more important than the salvation of your child when you're a saved parent. I understand that. But I don't understand sometimes the big drama that comes along with this. You know, somewhere, if you raise a child with the right kind of music in the atmosphere, with the Bible, with prayer, and you have that child in your home, Eventually, that child is going to start saying, I think I want to be saved. Yeah. You know what you do? And, and they come to me and, and I say, I'm not sure. I don't, want to, I don't want to mess this up. And I think, who do you think you are? Really, do, do you think that you're, and I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a predestinarian, okay? 
But what kind of God do you have, and who do you think you are, that you can foul this up? I mean, really. You know, don't get out all the drama here. God loves that little child more than you do. Wants them saved more than you do. And let's just say they come to you on Monday. And, and they say, you know, I'd like to be saved. Probably based on something they heard in Sunday school on Sunday. And it went to bed with them and they woke up with it. And they, you know, four or five years old somewhere. I'd like to be saved. Here's what I, I suggest. I say, why don't you tell them, well, so-and-so's got a new puppy. Why don't we go look at the new puppy and we'll talk about it after that. I say, why? Because if you can easily distract them from it, then it's probably not Holy Ghost conviction. Let's go play candy cane first, or let's go make cookies, or, or whatever. And if they cannot be distracted, they will not be moved from that. And it's, no, mommy, i got to be saved. No, no, oh, no, no, I, gotta, I don't want to be, I don't want to see puppies, I don't want to make cookies, I want to be, okay, well then fine, leave the Christ. Let's just say that maybe they weren't really ready. Do you think, do you think that if they were really, so, that they really weren't ready to be saved right then and there? And it was going to take a few more weeks before they really are ready. And, 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 and you led them in a sinner's prayer and went through the motion, so to speak, and they didn't get to it. You think God's going to punish you for that by killing them the next day? Do you think so? What's wrong with you? But that's the way people like when they come to me and, talk, and want to talk to me about this. I kind, of, I kind of feel like the disciples did about the people bringing them. You're wasting my time! Yes, I know it's important. But come on, God is merciful. God is gracious. God loves that child. He wants to save that child. And if you lead that child in a sinner's prayer five days early, they'll forget all about it and come to you again sooner, soon enough and be saying the same thing. Good, I, I want to get saved. Daddy, please, Mommy, please, please. i got to get saved. You'll hear it again. He's not. He is. You know, don't misunderstand me here, but when people come to me with that little kind of a, Concerned, you know, I'm just, I don't want to mislead my children. I don't want to, I don't want to have them pray before they're ready and so forth. I tell them this, I said, and, and I'll use this name because probably nobody in here has a child by this name. But when they come down, I say, I say, listen, I think little Adolf <laughs> is as saved as they're going, as they can be right now. I know that you, you think, uh, you probably think I'm some kind of weird, but listen. I believe that when children are raised with the truth, they respond to it to whatever degree they can. And nobody is saved by degrees, and nobody is saved by percentages, and nobody is saved gradually. There will be one day where they're instantaneously saved and birthed into God's kingdom. But in the meantime, they have a tendency to respond to the truth that they're able to comprehend. And if little Adolf had a prostitute for a mother and a drug dealer for a dad, he'd be a Sox fan. But I mean, uh, <laughs> no, if, if, if that was it, and he died, and he, he would go to heaven just like if he had saved parents. But little Adolf with saved parents is going to be exposed to the presence of Jesus Christ and the Word of God, and he's a whole lot more likely to get saved once he understands that he's a sinner than he would be in the other situation. And, then, and little Adolf, if he prayed a sinner's prayer and he wasn't ready to do so, he's still going to go to heaven. And if he's still under the preaching of the gospel and he's still in a spiritual atmosphere and he wasn't saved when he prayed a sinner's prayer, then God's going to bring it to his mind again that he needs to be saved and the time will come when it'll take. Yeah. You know, I, God, it's not like God is never going to deal with them again because you slipped up. Get over yourself. You are not that big of a foul up to where you can mess up God saving your children. Because you led them to Christ the wrong day. Hey, now, you're going to play hip-hop music in your house, run around half naked, and yell and scream at each other. Okay, well, yeah, then you're probably going to mess it up. Sure. But you read the Bible, you pray, take them to church. You have Christian music playing in the house. You act like Christians towards one another. And I mean, you know, for the most part. I wouldn't say you had to be perfect, but you know, you have the right kind of atmosphere. I don't think you can mess this up. I think God's grace and mercy transcends our stupidity and incompetence 
by a long shot. Amen. And then one more thing. You know, he said, of such is the kingdom of God. And, again, we're talking about good kids here. Uh, there are some virtues that you see in children. I wish they were in all children. But in children, you can see simple faith and dependence on the greater. Children aren't concerned with trying to go out and, and make a way for themselves. Uh, they expect there to be a roof over their head tomorrow. They expect there to be food in the, in the refrigerator tomorrow. They don't expect that they're going to be turned out on the street and hungry. They don't expect that. Why? Because they have simple faith and trust that everything is going to be taken care of. I woke up in a bed this morning. I had something to eat today. I went to bed. I'm going to bed tonight. I expect the same thing to happen tomorrow. We're the ones who worry about it, aren't we? Yeah. We're going to have a place to stay tomorrow. We're going to have, or what's going to happen when I retire? Am I going to be able to look, keep my standard of living? And all those things that fret us, they don't fret little children. Unworldliness. You know, I mean, they're just not that tied to the world. They might want some stupid cereal or other toy they saw on commercial on Saturday morning with the cartoons, but, but they're really not that tied to the world like we are as adults. We want to know what's, you know how many more days Paris Hilton's going to be in jail and who's going to get in and a Cole's baby and all that sort of thing that people are all worried about. Disregard for earthly treasure and disregard for promotion. They really don't care who's at the top. They're just happy in their place. Humility, harmlessness, godliness. You know, I, I wish every time I saw a child, I saw those things, because that's what a child's supposed to be. These days, parents don't seem to be doing a very good job, and I see a lot of defiant, scornful, worldly, greedy, proud, angry, violent, dangerous little criminals. But, but there's, there are good kids. They do exist. And, and, and by the way, if you want to know how to raise good kids, don't ask me. I don't know anything. Ask all the people in my church whose kids are rebellious. It's my fault. Right? They did everything I said and the kids turned out wrong. So I must not know anything about it. I, I'm being facetious here, but I remember Brother Hasbrook once in the tent meeting. He had that, that family red-headed guy, flat-footed guy. You know what I'm talking about? And, it was, and they quote the scripture, you know, and his wife would play. You know, and, he, and they all got quote the scripture. I don't know, like, like, you know, the 119th Psalm backwards or something like that. And, and I, you know, Brother Hasbro gets up and says, he said, now, he said, if you want to know how you get kids like that, don't ask me. Some people's kids just turn out wise and obedient and respectful and spiritual. And, do, and other people's kids just come out hellions. He said, I have no idea what the, what the solution is. It's just some people's kids come out that way and some people's kids come out this way. You know how sarcastic he was. Beautifully, I can't pull it off the way he did, but you knew exactly where he was coming from. And then he said, if you believe that, you need to get right with God. <laughs> but you know, some people, people have it because their kids are lazy and selfish and out of control and proud and full of the devil. It must not be anything I did, so it has to be the church's fault. So don't, don't, whatever you do, don't ask the pastor because they don't know anything. But I, I've seen some virtues in children that Jesus is referring to here. And you know, one thing you'll never see in a child is self-righteousness. Even the worst kid, even the most out of control little monster, and it's more the parent's problem than his. But I've never seen a little kid put off, you know, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm such a good person. You know, I mean, I've been going to church for decades and I've put tens of thousands of dollars in missions and I'm a pillar in the church and a pillar in the community and if anybody's going to make it, I am. Uh, kids don't have that idea, do they? They don't usually have pride of knowledge. I, I, I've seen some little girls, little bossy four or five-year-old girls that are just insufferable know-it-alls. So I guess they can have, they don't know anything, but the little bit they do know, they're very proud of it. They think they know more than all the adults around them. It really annoys me. But, but most of the time, children don't have pride of knowledge. You know, you try to tell them something. You try to instruct them. You try to teach them. And they say, okay, okay. And they believe that you know what you're talking about. You try to teach them how to add. And they, they, they listen. You try to teach them the alphabet. And they listen. Teach them their numbers. Teach them their colors. And they listen. Isn't that a wonderful thing? 
those newborn babes. Yeah. Desire sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You know, I guess the only other thing that may be nearly as frustrating as a little four-year-old girl who thinks she knows everything is a person who's been saved a very short time and grown very little in grace who thinks they know everything. It's kind of that way when I graduated from Bible. I've been at this a while now. You know, I'm smart now. Getting the more I know, the more I realize I didn't know anything. I'd like to tell you that all children have sensitive consciences and that they cry easily over the wrong things they do because they have an unseared conscience, but not all of them are that way. I've met some little monsters that, that believe they have a right to do whatever they please and demand that the whole world serve their impulses, but, but a good child, a well-ordered child, you know, when you correct them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, baby. Instead of bowing up, who do you think you are? And what right do you have to tell me? And who made you? Who died and made you God? And all that stuff that Christians give off when they're being corrected. You know what? You know, when you're being corrected, you don't know what you do. It'd probably take till Friday night for you to get there. That's where we want to be, isn't it? You know, when, I mean, when you find, you know, instead of resisting it and chafing yeah. it, it's like, I'm proud. I got a bitter spirit. Critical. I jump to the wrong conclusions about people. I got a nasty nature and I'm unforgiving. Because you gave up your alcohol and rock music and cigarettes and all that a long time ago. So you've arrived, right? Those are the only things that matter. I don't think I heard Brother McGee talking about things like emulations and things over there that works the flesh. That's where the work's going to have to be done. When you get chewed on about that stuff, how about you just, the kingdom of God is so such. Of such is the kingdom of God. People who are instructable, teachable, who respond the way they should, who are grieved and sorry when they mess up and, are e and, and take a rebuke easily. I wish that all children were inept at lying. They're not. I've seen, again, some little, little children that are amazingly skilled at deception and maneuvering. But the ones with good parents aren't. I mean, they're, they're transparent. They're not very good at lying to you. They're not good at hiding anything. You say, did you do that? <laughs> you know what? Because that's the way they're supposed to be. That's the way we're supposed to be. Don't you sit there and pretend like you got no problems and it's for somebody behind you. Yeah. Good. <laughs> you know, we get real good. All men are liars. We get real good at it. And then, and then, this, this, this is, when did I start? Yeah. Okay. Hey, man, you know, I, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> I don't want to, I really, I don't want to go on. I, I don't, but, but, if nobody's in a hurry, you know, I don't believe that baby dedications are anywhere in the Bible. I don't believe they're necessary. But I'm not against them either. But I've noticed this in the few years I've been in the ministry, is that the people that are the most concerned that we have a baby dedication are usually the ones that are the most unlikely to do what they're supposed to do at home. And I find that the parents that are going to do what they're supposed to do, they're not interested in having a baby dedication they did that somewhere back in the privacy of their own room when they came home from the doctor and found out there was a baby on the way. You know, there's a baby dedication, just infant baptism without the water, and it is not an insurance policy against negligent parenting. But, may I say, I don't think there's one thing wrong with publicly saying in front of a group of people, I want to be held accountable to raise this child for the honor and glory of God. I see myself as a steward and I have been loaned this child for 18 to 21 years somewhere in there and I have taken my responsibility to raise this child and to see to it that this child lives in the will of God seriously. You don't have to have a baby dedication to do that. But you know, I wonder sometimes if some Christian parents, people in my church, 
have ever, ever conceivably done anything of the kind. And if they did, they sure didn't seem to be mean of business. Because I don't see that their goal is to raise that child for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Do you understand? Children are recruits for the army of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's, that's where they're supposed to come from. God's choice of servants shouldn't be coming from the world like most of us that you're going to hear from this week. It's a tragedy. I know those that are forgiven much love much, but, oh man, kids raised in God and homes could accomplish so much more. But I, I think sometimes those parents, they don't get it. That child belongs to God first. They're only borrowing it. And, I, and let me tell you what the greatest reward in life is, and I know your pastors experience that, and that is to enjoy the friendship of your adult children who share your convictions. That is where it's at. Nothing better. 18 and 23, and they're not perfect, but I would say that they're pretty much shaped into who they're going to be as adults, and we share convictions. And man, do I enjoy that. Well, I, I look forward to that, and I enjoy that today. But you know, they're not mine. They're his. And I really did try to take that responsibility seriously to raise them for him. And I know not sometimes it just doesn't turn out the way you want to, but man, you have no guarantee if you just do it recklessly. You have pretty much guaranteed it's going to go wrong if you do it recklessly, and you might do it right and something go wrong, and you know, and, and for a few years things be fouled up before it gets right again. I, I know that happens, but I just I see parents from the day one it's all wrong. The music's wrong, the attitudes are wrong, their faithfulness to church is wrong, where they spend their money is wrong, everything's wrong. You just like you said, I you have that saying, I hate it when I'm right. See it coming. And I know who's going to get the blame when they go to the devil. You know, it's amazing how parents will believe a child, a, a, a stupid teenager who drinks, who fornicates, who may be taking drugs, who's probably looking at pornography, who's got the worst kind of music going on in his head. He'll take that child's word for why he doesn't go to church. Yeah. <laughs> because they might do all that sort of thing, but they wouldn't lie to me about why they don't go to church. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? And they'll, 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 this is why they don't go to church. Something he said. Or something she did. That's what they'll tell you about why they don't go to church. And, and you'll believe them. They would drink. They would fornicate. They would smoke. They would take dope. They would listen to hip-hop and rap and thrash metal and every other. But, but their word is good. Yeah. I, you know, some, I wish I had some kind of spiritual chainsaw to hit the top of your head off and put some intelligence and some wisdom in it. Because it ain't getting through this way. If you would ever think about, what do you, you believe them when they say that? And that's what you tell all your friends. My kid would come to church except for years ago, the pastor offended them. Years ago, the pastor's wife said something and they just haven't ever gotten over it. And that's why they don't come to church. They live like the devil because they want to. Right. Just like everybody else. Right. But you know, the most striking thing, though, about a little child, especially an infant, is, is this helpless. helpless. They can't do one thing for themselves. Every baby born in the human race has that in common with every other one. Absolute, complete dependence and inability. And that's how you come to God. I got nothing. I am nothing. I can do nothing. I offer nothing. I am fully and absolutely dependent upon you. And you have that attitude. That's, that's what the kingdom of God is supposed to all be about. Humble reliance, <clears throat> conscious awareness of your own inability and inaptitude to accomplish anything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but without me, Jesus said, he can do nothing. Absolute dependence. You're going to make your way on you? You're going to do your thing on you? You got your life planned, do you? You got it all mapped out. You're in control. You're behind the wheel. You got your plan. And then you're operating outside of God's kingdom. You're working in somebody else's kingdom here. You need to get back where you belong. There's 
newborn babes desire that sincere no words you may grow thereby. And what can you do? I'll close. Remember that the Spirit of God can and does work in children just as effectively as he does in older people. From the moment you bring them home, from, from the moment they're born, from before they're born, you should be having the right kind of music and you should be having the right kind of atmosphere and the right kind of spirit in your house while they're still in the womb. Expose them to the presence of God. Like I said earlier, get them to church as early as possible and as often as possible and cultivate a godly atmosphere in your home and expose them to the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law abounded that sin might abound, or sin abounded grace to abound. Or should you say, where, where for the law, excuse me, where for the law was given, that sin might abound. You know how you know how you have abundance of sin? First, in order to have an abundance of grace, you've got to have an abundance of sin. Or sin abounded grace too much more abound. In other words, you've got to understand how abundantly sinful you are. In order to understand how abundantly sinful you are, one of two things has to happen. You have to sin abundantly, or you have to have abundant law put on you. I use my assistant pastor, Matt Marshall, and I as contrasts on that. When I was saved, I knew that I was a sinner. Why? Because of abundant sin. I wasn't the worst sinner ever lived, but I was about as bad as an 18-year-old can get. And I knew that there was no question at all about my sinfulness to me. I didn't have a lot of law, but I had so much sin, it was undeniable. Every time I looked in the mirror, I loathed what I saw. Matt Marshall, he didn't have many opportunities to sin. But he's understood that he was a sinner when he was yet very young. Why? Because of abundance of law. And when he messed up, his parents told him he messed up. And he knew that he had a sin problem and a rebellion problem and a disobedience problem and a pride problem when he was just a little bitty thing. It was clear to him, and that's how he was able to be saved. Expose him to the law, often and early. And if you justify everything they do, you are more than likely prolonging their salvation, if not making it impossible for them ever to be saved because they're not going to see themselves as what they are, guilty sinners. They need to come under conviction and be burdened about their sin. And you do that by telling them when they have and correcting them for it, not making excuses. He's just tired. And so forth. Expose them to the law. Number four, expose them to the gospel. So that they know that God is merciful and gracious and ready to forgive all that come in humble obedience and repentance and faith. And then take their decisions and surrenders to God's calling their life seriously. You got a girl, she'll be graduating from Pensacola Christian's nursing program next year. She's going on a medical missions trip this year. She surrendered to go as a missionary to China, I believe, when she was nine years old. She's going to graduate from nursing school next year. She's already preparing to go to China as a medical missionary. That was a decision made by a small child. She's never, ever left that decision. Take it seriously. Support them enthusiastically in pursuing it. And don't try to steer them towards something more financially advantageous. Oh, you don't really want to go into ministry because they don't make any money. Why don't you learn how to do this first so that you have a good career and then think about going into ministry after that. Don't put your hands on it. You will foul it up. And don't call them yourself. Don't call them yourself. And don't belittle them if they don't experience a call. That is God's business. And He knows how to get the job done. He can call them without your help. And above all, pray for them. I mean, that sounds glib. Really, pray for him. Thank God he never changes. And he cared for little boys and he cared for little girls and he cared for little infants when he was here on the earth and certainly seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He cares for him just as much now as he ever did. Every parent wants his child to enter the kingdom of God. And as for me, I'm grateful that it's really pretty easy. It never was up to me. It's up to him. He's told me to do a few things. And I try to do those things and again try to follow the, the, the impressions from Scripture about having the right presence around Him. Get Him in Jesus' presence and trust Him to do the rest. And I am grateful that it's easy for my children and for your children and my grandchildren when they come to 
to be safe. I admonish you to just ease up. Get over the drama. Don't take yourself so seriously. Have some trust in God. Don't make a big deal over it. Just pray that they're saved. Give them the right exposure. Leave it in God's hands and enjoy the ride. Amen. And then if you're a man or a woman today and you are not in the kingdom of God, you're not functioning in God's kingdom, you aren't operating the way we talked about when we got to those issues about the virtues of children, you don't want to be shut out of that. You don't, want to, you, don't, you don't want to be left outside the door somewhere wishing you had a part in this. Suffer little children, come to me, forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. Whosoever will not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. I know that's about salvation, but it's about more than salvation. You're going to have to take that position as you sit in that pew of a little child. I know nothing. I can do nothing. I provide nothing, I contribute nothing, I am nothing except for here to learn and to be instructed and to respond right to what I'm told. If you can have that attitude, God can do something with you. Amazing things, but only on that basis. Let's pray. Father, I thank, thank you for the time and the attention that people laid long, but I'm glad that I had a chance to give these thoughts and I pray that they'd be a help. I pray, Lord, as this week begins, that you would see childlike humility, childlike faith, childlike tenderheartedness in us so that, Lord, that we would respond as we should and grow as we could in Jesus Christ for your use. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, thank you. And get used to it because it will be around 9 o'clock every night. I mean, that's just normal. Okay, that's just camp meeting. And uh, if you're wore out, you need to be wore out. Yeah, oh yeah, you need to be wore out. And there was enough in that, uh, I believe God was in that. I mean, I just believe it. Because the rest of this week, there'll be all sorts of different things hammered on, and a lot of times people need that family too. A whole lot. And uh, some people do think it's just a, a, a genie and a lamb. And God's a bellboy. And uh, he doesn't like that. Amen. But, uh, well, thank you for that. And I was facetious saying, hey, and I forget yeah. about your, I forgot about your sensitivities. But, yeah. uh, and now you're going to go home. You're going to be, you're going to be bugging me all the way at my house. You're going to come over to my house tonight. And you're gonna, what is it exactly you're going to hate? You're going to hate. And I'm going to have to give you a list and you're going to feel bad. Well, this is what I think about you, too. I wish you would do this and this, you know. And uh, I remember Dr. Nomi when I come into the church over there, that uh, it's an amazing thing. I kept wearing my chain with my belt. I mean, my, you know, the biker. It's no big deal. I put my suit on. I even had wingtips, but I had that chain on. Every now and then I walked by and he just grabbed the chain and smiled. I know nothing about that. I mean, I don't know what's going on. I found I was just getting aggravated and mad, you know. And then, then I felt bad for getting mad at him. Then I was confused. Why am I feeling bad about getting mad at him. He's the one, man, you know, because you know how you are, it's worldly. That sucker done grab my chain on my belt and look at where you think he is? Little short old, 80 year old man. You know, yeah, he pulled my chain, you're right. And, uh, and uh, he said, uh, he said, when are you gonna get rid of that and stop being worldly? I said, then I almost got mad again. And I said, is this worth it? Is this really worth it? I was angry with this, I just didn't do it, you know? Now if I get on the motorcycle again, I have it, so my wallet don't find out. And then that's a practical thing. Being practical is one thing. Amen? <laughs> I'm setting myself up, man. When you get on a motorcycle, I don't want to fall out. I mean, there would be a practical thing for doing that, but to wear that, just to wear that with my suit, was letting everybody know I was still plugged in, and I didn't even know what I was doing. Amen? Everybody up now? All right, amen. I wonder why I said that. I don't know. I'm just rambling too. I'm going to go home and probably do things you're not supposed to do, like eat before you go to bed. And uh, we'll pray about that. We appreciate Brother Huff making it in and be here tomorrow. And pray for others to get in tomorrow. Pray for Brother um, Henson. It'll be Wednesday. Uh, he'll be coming in and hopefully that his foot is healed and we're ready to go through the diabetes and everything. And uh, pray that some of our friends won't be 
uh, lured away with another meeting happening at the same time with somebody I do like, and I don't know why, but anyway, one of my little things, yeah, you know, I like them. And, but uh, it's just amazing it was at this time, I told my church it was like when I went to Midwestern, you know, and, and uh, they finally caught on that some certain person always went to Dr. Herbert Noways in October. And so after the first two years, we was all going to this meeting over there, you know, uh, and because uh, I wasn't a member yet, and I was meeting this guy named uh, Peter Sturgis uh, Ruckman, you know, and they had this big old deal about uh, this King James issue. Next thing I know, after the two years, they started having events at the college during that exact same time. And if you're a student here, you better be here. You better be loyal to this college. And uh, they didn't say nothing bad about anything, but they just know how to weed people. You know, you know. So that's why I feel I have a, I have a psychological hang-up on that I, I paranoia complex, which I believe people are out to get me half the time. And, and since this is our meeting, and this is our big meeting, and to have a meeting at this time and to know that Oh, duh, you had a meeting? I've been doing it for 12 years. I, I just think like that. It's just street thinking. And Lord will probably whip me and say, it's got nothing to do with it. They couldn't schedule this guy for 20 years, and finally this is the time it came up, you know. But until then, I think bad. So you got to pray for me. Amen. Trust the brotherhood. The real brotherhood. Amen. So, so uh, tomorrow night, uh, 7 o'clock, uh, if you have to work tomorrow and you're wore out right now, I'm sorry. Drink more coffee in the morning. And a uh, lot to think about tonight if you're under conviction, if you're saying, was he talking to me? Most likely. Amen. And he's trying to help you out, amen. And, uh, and uh, so get that thing down. Look in the Bible the way things are supposed to be done in the Bible and you'll be a lot better off. Period. All right, well... Brother Bill Critcher, why don't you close in prayer? Father, thank you for just speaking our hearts. Thank you for these men coming, showing up, our God. Thank you for the time we have been here and just being able to Amen, amen. You drive, drive careful, people.